Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante, and I'm with Wikibon.org. And this is SiliconAngle.tv's continuous coverage of IBM Information On Demand, IOD. And this is theCUBE, where we bring you all the best guests that we can find at events, at tech events, within the enterprise. We try to extract the signal from the noise and deliver to you our audience. Uh, we're here at IOD for two days. We'll be at Strata on Wednesday and Thursday. We've got you know, two CUBEs going on this week. Teams flying all over the country, equipment flying all over the country. We're here live in the, in the, at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. And I'm here with David Inbar, who's the Senior Director of Big Data Products and Solutions at Pervasive Software, uh, uh, an IBM partner. And uh, we're going to talk about big data, we're going to talk about data and integration and some of the things that you guys are doing. David, welcome to theCUBE. Great, good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, so first of all, IOD. Um, Big event, uh, I don't know if you saw the keynotes this morning. Yes, uh, big, big event. Jason and Silva was uh, blasting <laughs> us with, uh, with big data <laughs> concepts. I needed a fire hose to drink from his, uh, his, his discussion, right. but it was good. And uh, we love the idea of big fire hoses of data. That's really one of the areas we're specializing in. Uh, we've got a whole business unit devoted to big data and big data analytics tools. So and we're very excited about it. And we, we started researching and pre preparing for this quite a few years ago. So talk about the company. Um, it's a publicly uh, traded company. You got your earnings call today. Probably going to have it as we're on As on we're this talking. Call. Yep. Right. So, uh, so we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, your market's closed, so you're, 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 you're probably just about to make that release, so obviously we can't talk about that. But talk about the company and then we'll get into this, the big data specifics, because you guys have been around for a while. Okay, yes, we've been around for a long time by software company standards, yeah. around over 25 years uh, as an independent company, which is pretty unusual. Uh, but uh, we're reasonable size, about 50 million a year, uh, relentlessly profitable, and most, most importantly and most interestingly is we have literally tens of thousands of customers around the world who leverage our software or embed our software in interesting solutions that they're delivering to their customers. So, so give us some examples of you know, some of your customers and some of the things that they're doing. Sure, so on, on the database side, we're embedded inside a lot of accounting applications. So we have a database product that's embedded inside accounting applications, project management applications, uh, project tracking, all kinds of uh, let's call them traditional transaction-centric kinds of applications. Not the kinds of things you'd think of with big data, but they are applications that run businesses all around the world. And on the integration side, we have data integration products that allow companies and partners to shuttle data backwards and forwards, synchronize it between lots of different applications, both on premise and in the cloud. So we have a lot of experience with cloud-based deployments of things like integration, as well as on-premise. So in a way, you guys have somewhat of an independent perspective on all this. So you're seeing the, the worlds of, of tr you know, traditional data analysis and structured data collide with big data, which is largely unstructured. What's your angle on what's going on there, and how does pervasive add value in that, um, that integration? Uh, it's a great question. Are you really going to let me loose on this? Yeah, go. So, uh, <laughs> so, so we see big data as being both structured and unstructured. Because part of the big data avalanche, of course, is what people call unstructured. Some of that is indeed text-based, sentiment analysis, uh, analyzing emails, analyzing Twitter feeds, those kinds of things. A lot of it is machine-generated data, or sensor-generated data and those volumes are climbing extremely quickly as well. So the big data challenge is not just an unstructured data challenge, it's an all around data challenge. And how do you, as you mentioned at the beginning, how do you extract the signals out of a massive avalanche of noise at this point? Uh, we started to look at that problem not, in, not entirely knowingly uh, seven years ago or more because we had integration software and our customers were coming to us and saying, well, we've got this much more data every year and we've got this much less time window in which to process it, whether we integrate it, uh, enrich it, validate it, whatever it was that they were doing. Uh, 
are you going to be able to be with us as we go on that trajectory? And we looked at some of it and we thought, well, we're pretty hot, we know software, sure. Uh, but we started coming across instances where the growth rate was really getting interesting, including some of the early uh, web search engines companies, I can't give a name, but we, we were talking to some of them about their log file processing requirements, and we started to see this is a whole new order of magnitude, maybe several orders of magnitude different. So we put a, a separate research team together to build what we call the next generation integration platform. And they came back to us with a, something that was optimized for leveraging multi-core processors, which were, we could see coming as commodity, weren't obvious then. And they built a, what we call a parallel data flow engine, which is now called Data Rush. And that, that platform, which we've now had embedded in some of our products for three or four years, so it's robust technology, we know it works, it's out with hundreds of customers, is now the core of our big data analytics push because that's capable of handling hundreds of, literally hundreds of millions, billions of rows of data both structured and unstructured, on very modest hardware. So uh, we're, we're now starting to deliver big data tools for really, really tough problems that take advantage of also the new architectures, we'll talk about Hadoop and Big Insights, and that deliver new economics to, to customers. Because that's really the issue here. It's not that all the traditional data warehousing and relational database and everything else aren't delivering huge value, they are and they'll continue to do so, but they're not going to scale to 100x and 1000x, which is what we're starting to see. So John, this is music to our audience's ears, running all this on commodity hardware, <laughs> and, you know, new infrastructures. Yeah, so the thing I want to, people are always talking about you know, ETL this and high performance that, it's usually higher end systems, commodity or industry standard hardware, depending on who you talk to, uh, is important to be part of that. But the question I have is, Talk about the software side of it. So let's talk about Hadoop, for example. Big, right. big is all the rage. Um, connectors sounds like a really easy solution. What's your view on connectors with Hadoop? Some are saying, hey, connectors are bad unless you actually know what you're doing. Connectors are not the, it's not the silver bullet. A connector to Hadoop is not the silver bullet. Well, Had connectors is part of the story, but it's not the biggest part. So is it helpful to have connectors to other systems so you can pull more data into Hadoop? Sure. Is it useful to be able to read some data out of Hadoop? But the significance of Hadoop is it's a massive general purpose. For moving data around, it's good. Connect systems together. And for running analytics. So if you want to, if you want to run machine learning algorithms, if you want to do predictive analytics on combinations of different data sets that have correlations or don't, or rules that are hidden that you don't know about or don't, Hadoop lets you do that. The traditional predictive analytics approach to things was to say, okay, I'm going to build a model. In order to build that model, I'm going to take a sample set of my data because I can't process all of it. And I'm going to figure out a model with a degree of certainty yeah. that it works <laughs> yeah. and that it's this percentage accurate. And so, with Hadoop and the right software running on Hadoop, and we'll come back to that, uh, you can just, run your analytics on all your data. So you can, you've, you've got a high degree of certainty and you'll start noticing the anomalies. Think about all the data. That are really wants valuable. to do it on all Kill sampling, data. right? Like Abby Mehta says, sampling's dead. Sampling's all, dead. Yeah. All the data. I mean, yeah, if you want to look at, you want to look at all the, all the inbound network traffic into your environment and you want to start detecting what they call yeah. advanced persistent threats, long running, really sophisticated intrusion. You can't so, just do it on the last five minutes. You'd better be able yeah, to yeah, go yeah. back doing it over the last five months and five Different years. Different database. We talked about age base, time series, relational. Um, but I want to drill down and back to the connector conversation because really there's two modes that people think about. Batch, mm -hmm. do all kinds of analytics, store it, and then do batch, uh, do analytics on that, and then real time. It's like they seem to be converging. There's an overlap between near real time, what does real time mean? So we'll just call it real time, near real time. And kind of like just analytics on yep. stored data. Can you talk about that and how that's evolving from your perspective? Uh, absolutely, so you're absolutely right. They've been traditionally thought of as two separate arenas with separate sets of tools to address each of them. 
and you've got uh, batch data where you've stored it, and it could be in a database, could be in, it could be in DB2, it could be in HBase, could be in Cassandra, whatever it is, and you query it, and you keep adding to it. And you preferably want reasonable real-time addition to it and updates, but then you've had this world of streaming data and what they call CEPs, complex event processing engines, just closer to the world of Wall Street trading, that's extreme real time. But in most businesses, decision timelines are probably, you know, 30 seconds or they're 10 minutes or they're a couple of hours depending on the interaction that's going on. Uh, that division from our point of view is artificial. Um, so from that? our perspective. Why is that? Because uh, if, if you're using the right approach, we, we built data rush on what we call a data flow principle. So everything to us is a flow of data, whether it's whether you're pulling it off a disk or you're Excuse inhaling me. it off a feed of some kind or another. I like that term, inhaling it. It's data. A lot of it's, it's big. It's, it's a big. It's, it's a big toke, as they say, of data. <laughs> Inhaling <Right>. the exhaust. <laughs> right. It's it, it's data, and you want to <laughs> you want to run analysis on it of the last five seconds or the last two seconds, but you also want to run analysis on it on the last week and the last month, and joining with all kinds of other data. In principle, and you know, if you if you break it apart, the you know the processing you need to do is the same, and yet. Traditionally, we've had vendors focusing and delivering different tools for each of those things. A lot of it could actually be common. And we're probably going to see a lot more of that going forward. So as we're going to be at Strata and yes. Hadoop World uh, next week, O'Reilly's big event. This week. I mean this, this week. This week. Well, tomorrow. Uh, I'll yeah, be there tomorrow. tomorrow. Setting up. I've got, I've got colleagues who are going to be there as well. <laughs> I'll so be there setting events. up tomorrow on broadcasting Wednesday and then Dave will fly in. We're physically at both events. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, <laughs> yeah, um, sorry to hear that. I'll, I'll <laughs> stay here. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's big data week. It's, I was saying, it's bigger than Shark Week if we were on cable. We'd be pulling in the ratings. Don't anyway, be sorry, we love this. We, uh, <laughs> we do, we live um, for this. But Hadoop and that emerging ecosystem is all where all the coolness is, right? It's where the action is, the sandboxes, and the emerging new startups and the tech. Here at IBM IOD, you know, Pauline Nissim Intel called it the adult supervision of big data, that's IBM. Um, you have, everyone's growing up into the, into the big leagues, right? Um, what is the requirements? What are the table stakes to play at that level? I want you to talk about that. And then to talk about some of the barriers that need to be taken down to get there. Right, right. So t table stakes, minimal table stakes, you talked about connectors and a lot of vendors have come out and said, yeah, connect we, connect to, we connect to Hadoop, which is good, that's fine. You yeah. can pull and push yeah, the data. Yeah, yawn, you know, right. <laughs> yeah, I got a connector. Right. Yeah. So but, what? But you know, the, the really interesting thing about Hadoop and big insights here at IOD is it's extremely powerful, but it could be a pain, a real bear to get it set up, running, and then you start writing code to make use of it and using MapReduce, and then you, you've got to have people with special skills. So I think, as an industry, the real challenge is, can you make it as easy to use as the technologies that are you know, 10 years old, 20 years old? Is it, can you get it to that level of maturity where it doesn't matter to the business analyst. Business analyst has data, they want to understand it. They shouldn't have to care, is it Hadoop running in the background? Is it IBM DB2? Is it to MySQL, whatever it is, or is it a set of files? That should be transparent. So that's what I think the real table stakes are now. Is there software out there that can do that? And then the, the other big topic, I'm just going to throw it out there, uh, which we may or may not want to go down that track, is the energy consumption of all of this activity. Oh, uh, there's, been some other, there's been some other articles and conversations about that and data centers are you know are proliferating and absorbing more and more electricity every day and the people who are building those data centers are doing a great job on making them more efficient the hardware vendors and the chip builders are doing a great job every year of making their equipment more efficient the software writers and application writers are actually the guys who are the big obstacle here because they're still largely delivering software that is serial in nature and doesn't leverage multi-core hardware 
And if you look inside most data centers and most computer systems, and you look at CPU utilization, you'll be lucky if you're above 20%. Most situations you're going to be closer to 12%. Even in a highly virtualized environment, most, oh, most the of the comes calls out. are the not comes being out. used. Yeah, it's true, right? Not people, being people used. People talk about 70, 80% utilization. It's, and it's not the case in most situations. Except with pervasive. So Why is that? But the, well, that's because of this, uh, this rush analyzer and data rush technology we built is designed to automatically, at runtime, looks end to end at what you're trying to do, looks at how many cores and spindles you've got, where your data's distributed, and optimizes. And then you'll see all the cores light up accordingly and run at 70 or 80%. And it's, it's energy saving, it's hugely faster, and it's why we have partners and customers like Opera Solutions that are standardizing on Data Rush because they can build their analytics once and their, their people don't have to care about what hardware it's running on. They can deploy it on small systems, on big systems, and it'll run incredibly efficiently on all of them. So, so that's my plug. So Opera, uh, it's, it's, since you brought them up, is a very interesting company. Uh, we first found them, um, geez, I can't remember now, John. We had uh, them on no, uh, Sapphire. Open World. No. SAP Sapphire, that's right. Not, a company doesn't do a ton of marketing, but when we did our, uh, the industry's first big data market sizing, Jeff Kelly, uh, the top big data analyst uh, at Wikibon, did the market sizing report. Opera came up, mm -hmm. you know, very surprising. It was number one or number two in the marketplace, you know, just behind Vertica in terms of revenues, uh, for pure place. And Opera uses your solution. Opera's a very as a, interesting company. As a key building block. Talk about it, it for something they call uh, Signal Hubs. Yep. Which is this really, it was a great name. Uh, but in Opera's this company with a couple hundred data scientists, they're solving real serious big data problems, driving productivity. So talk about how they use your solution a little bit, if you will. I, I will, and uh, they, they've been using us for less than a year, but they've started deploying now to uh -huh. multiple customers in, in industries there. You know, they're very big in financial services, capital markets, in federal and government spaces, as well as retail. Uh, their signal hub concept is this whole idea of extracting useful signals out of the mass of data that's flowing through organization systems. And they do that with all kinds of vertical market solutions. One of the early ones they've used this for is a risk management solution which is used by some of the largest financial institutions in the world for <laughs> managing their portfolios and their clients' portfolios. Uh, they had a situation, just to give you a case in point of where speed and efficiency really matters, uh, they had a customer where it was taking about 20 hours to update their, their portfolio with this risk management solution that uses advanced algorithms of one kind or another because of the massive new data and the accumulated historical data, 20 hours, which is okay, but it wasn't very exciting. They got it down to about 15 minutes using our software, same hardware, and that's nice because now you can do things faster, but I think the more interesting thing is the significance to that financial institution is that they can start innovating in how they're managing their risk and they can start doing, offering probably a wider range of services to their clients because they know that they can give them either lower risk or you know, broader opportunities to go handle their assets. I love these stories because it's you know, companies that you, you, most people haven't heard of solving real problems, you know, driving productivity, solving problems that a lot of the big whales can't necessarily solve, um, so they look to smaller companies. Yeah. Or, or, or they can, but it comes with a different price tag. It comes with a different price tag, maybe it takes yeah. longer, comes with other baggage. Right. <laughs> you know, yes. so. yes. David, my Excellent. final question before we break is, big question is, for big data insight from you is, what do you think is going to be different in the next five to 10 years with big data, all this stuff going to happen? I see the databases, more computation, commodity hardware scale out open source to full on IBM, big iron, developers, it's craziness right now. What's uh, What's your vision, next 10 years? Uh, well, I think what's, you know, what's most exciting is, is, is in a way the things we can't yet imagine today that we're all going to be able to do with big data. Because you know, in the next few years, we'll all of us have very powerful machines sitting on our desk as well as connection to a cloud with infinite resources. Uh, and 
we'll be able to dream up applications that, that, that we're not using today that we can't imagine. I mean, we're, we're carrying around our, our phones, our PDAs, one kind or another. You know, I can really start, I imagine I can really start using it to, uh, to understand what's going on with my health or I can start to use it to, to, to monitor uh, a mixture of macroeconomic with very industry specific data and start detecting patterns of one kind or another. And that, that's all very exciting. So it's the new businesses that are going to be built around that. Arguably you could say Google and Yahoo were generation one data centric businesses. But there are now what? A thousand startups and probably over the next few it's years. It's early another, too. Another 5,000 startups, yeah. all of whom. Vertical markets wide open. Yep. So the, tr the, the barriers that were there to really doing something with data are, are going away. Yeah, and entrepreneurial, uh, the entrepreneurship angle is just phenomenal. I think you, know, you could really start a company at very low, low cost right. and go innovate in a vertical. I mean, you could literally take one feature of a vertical that's disruptive, that no one's right. thought of yet, and literally, as a greenfield, completely disrupt that yeah. market. There's a relatively trivial example, but a good, maybe a good one to add, end on and start thinking a little bit about the potential. Uh, a jet engine, uh, on a jet engine on a commercial transport plane has approximately 1,500 sensors in it during a single trip across the Atlantic. Uh, it accumulates about three terabytes of data. At the end of the trip, that data gets thrown away. It doesn't have to be. Today, the, you know, today it's really not that expensive to start keeping that data and yeah, then yeah. start running analytics and saying, okay, so now we're going to start learning a whole lot more about not just fuel consumption, but about you know, yeah. engineering stress, about safety on the flights, about weather conditions. Yeah, I was talking to a it's friend. It's endless. I was talking to a friend the other night, we had a little geek's dad's uh, night out dinner, kind of, kind of, physically a bunch of guys get together and we drink wine and have uh, food brought in and we just talk tech. And we talked about the space jump, which was there an amazing go. publicity right. stunt. I mean, can't get any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> go to 25 miles and jump out. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. But they're instrumenting him all the way down. He went to a flat spin. Right, he's, so a, he's, a, he's an, an amazing data collector. He right? collected, <laughs> and, they, and the insight from that was that they now know what to do in a flat spin, as well as knowing how to take someone up to the edge of the atmosphere, which could be a portal to space travel. I mean, this is kind of the wacky science that people were talking about. So, you know, this right. is just the beginning because it's so inexpensive. Right. So think about that. If it's inexpensive to get people there, that's the first stop to Mars. So these are the kinds of things to me that is just so in intoxicating about the possibilities of big data. So, you know, we need you guys to keep on banging out your technology and IBM doing their thing, and we'll be at uh, Strata this week to, to get more. David, congratulations on all your success. Great to have you on theCUBE. Thank Cube. you. Appreciate Thanks. it. This is siliconangle.com and wikibon.org, The Cube, our flagship telecast. We're about to the events. We'll be right back to, uh, with our next guest right after this short break.